All right, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody had a nice Thanksgiving, maybe a little quieter this year than previous years, but uh, I hope it was good nonetheless. And I'm glad to see everyone here and uh, everyone at home. We've got lots of comments from folks at home over the holiday. Uh, just a couple of announcements to make. First, we are having communion today. It's the first Sunday of Advent, so we're having communion. If you didn't pick up your little cup, there's a basket in the back and one right up here in the front. Uh, this means we, we will not have communion next week, which would be the normal one, but since we're having it this week, so this will be our communion. So if folks at home have a chance to get some stuff ready if you want to join us for communion. A couple other announcements. The Expedition Group Christmas Party has been canceled. Uh, that was set for December the 6th, and uh, that has been canceled um, because of the uh, uptick in the COVID and all that stuff. We thought it was safest to, to just not uh, pursue that. So uh, the group will resume their regular class schedule on January the 3rd, and that's when they were supposed to start again after, uh, after the party anyway. So uh, they'll be resuming on the 3rd. Uh, Toys for Tots, the boxes are up here and downstairs, and they're taking new unwrapped gifts, and you can bring them in until December 13th. Uh, so Jonathan uh, Casillo is our representative. He'll be picking those up sometime right after the 13th. So, and as I said before, if you want to contribute, but you don't have a chance to shop, or you don't want to go out shopping for toys, you can make a donation to us and we'll make sure that uh, either toys are bought or we just turn the donations right over to Toys for Tots, whichever you would like us to do, uh, we can do that. So just please let us know. And I know a lot of people are using Amazon this time of year. and <clears throat> We still have a Smile Amazon account. And so if you go into the, in your Amazon account and look for the charities and put it in the church name, you'll see that we have a Smile account and we get a little percentage back from everything you buy. We get um, a little, we get a kickback. So it's, it's nice though. It, uh, and I'm, I'm not even sure how much we've gotten so far. We've been doing it for a long time. We might've gotten maybe a hundred bucks or something like that. I don't even know, but it's worth it. So with everybody shopping online, especially this year, I think that's gonna be a, a much bigger thing. Uh, we do have an Amazon account for that. So. Uh, uh, please keep that in mind if you're shopping on Amazon. We also have one very berry pie left. So we have what? No, we don't. No pie left. She bought it. Rosella bought it, so we're all good. That last pie has found a home. I'm glad to hear that. And um, so I hope everyone else got the pies they wanted. And uh, I don't know if there's any left in the freezer or not, if anybody. So if you ordered, no, there aren't any. Well, that's good. So everybody picked up their pies. <clears throat> and... Um, I'm glad for that. So are there any other announcements this morning? Then we'll continue with our prelude.
All who are able, please rise for our opening hymn number 419, Now Thank We All Our God.
We come into God's presence in hopeful anticipation. We await the coming of the Son of God. Still the Divine Spirit is with us. We hear Jesus' words, keep awake, be alert. I ask you to join with me as we uh, continue with the first Sunday of Advent, the first candlelight. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, so we light the first candle on the Advent wreath, the candle of hope. 25 centuries ago, in a time not much different from, than our own, when the Israelites had little hope for the future of their country or their people, the Jewish prophets called upon God to come to the people and make things right. They told the people and us that a Messiah would come as a new hope in the midst of suffering. Their prayers were answered with the birth of Jesus, also called Emmanuel, a Hebrew word which means God is with us. Today begins our Advent journey of waiting for the birth of the one who is called the light of the world and the hope of the nations. As we light the candle of hope, we give thanks for the prophets of today who dare to speak words of hope for liberation, who say no to the evil in the world, and who call us to overcome our comfortable fears so that we may let go of our faulty ways of thinking and doing and explore new realms of unimagined visions of how things could be. Please join me. So many in your world, holy God, have lost hope and put their hope in false prophets. Sometimes it feels you aren't with us, but are far, far away. We pray that you come into our world again. Be Emmanuel for us, so that we may notice where you are already present. Enter our hearts to see in new ways the creative power of hope. Help us live in your hope so that we may be your light shining in the dark places of our world. We pray this in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem and whose return we await. Amen. There is always hope in the presence of God in Jesus Christ. Please join me in our invocation. God of the four winds, blow your spirit through this space. From north and south, east and west, we gather to worship your holy name. We belong to you. We are clay in your hands. Open our ears to the sound of your voice, echoing through the spheres. Open our eyes to the brilliance of your presence, shining in each new day. Open our hearts to the new reign of Jesus Christ. Come now to earth. Amen. Fellow believers, if we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But as we confess our sins, God hears us and offers us mercy and compassion through Jesus Christ. So let us now confess as a family of believers, and then in silence bring our personal confessions to the Lord. You may be seated. God is peace, the ever-present, ever-loving, ever-compassionate power that governs the world. Like generations before us, we fail in our efforts to live in peace and harmony as God desires. As in Isaiah's time, we become unclean, and our righteous deeds become as filthy cloths. We alone cannot wipe clean the slate of our transgressions. We fade like leaves, and our inequities, like the wind, take us away.
Amen. At God's commands, the heavens open. The mountains quake and love descends as an ever-flowing stream. A light shines in the night and that night cannot endure. Trust that that power created you in love now forgives and renews you in the same divine spirit. Go forth and proclaim the awesome deeds of our loving God. Amen. Our first lesson this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 64. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our inequities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls in your name or attempts to take hold of you for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hands of our inequity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember inequity forever. Now consider, we are your people. This is the ancient story of God's people. And from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. But in those days after the suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lessons. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about the day or the hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time is coming. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves his home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the good news. Please join me as we confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my message be pleasing to you and reflect your will in our lives. Amen. Well, in case you haven't realized it by now, Christmas time is, is soon here. If you could just look around the room, you could see the decorations. I want to thank everyone who stayed last week and helped put those up. Uh, the uh, express train is back there for your cards. I'm not sure what we're going to have in cards this year. Maybe not so many, but you can always just send them the old-fashioned way in the mail if you don't want to bring them in uh, for the train. But uh, you can do as you uh, will with that. Or you can send messages on Facebook. That's becoming a new thing where families go on and make a little introduction of themselves and, and post it there for everybody to see. I don't know uh, how that's going to go, but... Uh, whatever way you want to greet people for Christmas, I think that'll be just fine. So I want you to think for a moment what your ideal Christmas gift would be. If you had to make a list and mail it to the North Pole, what would you put at the top of that list? What's on that list? Just think to yourself. You don't have to tell anybody else, but think about it. The one thing that if you could have whatever you wanted, what would go on that list? Just consider that for a moment. Over the past years, I've learned to anticipate the Christmas season with joy and a little dread. And maybe you feel some of that too. You feel the joy of the celebration. You feel the joy 
of the time of year, the, the season, we, we have our joy, we express it, but there's also that little bit of dread, all that work that needs to be done, all the things that have to be accomplished to make the time, to make the time perfect, or at least as perfect as we can make it. We fret over a lot of things. How many of you have put up Christmas lights already? Maybe put up the lights. Did you have to untangle them first? Did you have to test the bulbs and all that? Did you do the, the Clark Griswold thing and put them all up and none of them worked? You know, that kind of thing. You know, it can be frustrating. That's one of the things I like least about Christmas is putting up lights on the outside of the house, doing that kind of thing. I have helpers, but you know, the quality of my helpers just uh, leaves a little to be desired from time to time. And I'm not to say anything bad, but you know, they get bored and tired of it and they want to quit. I'm like, well, you only do half the house. It looks terrible. You got to do the whole thing. But anyway, I digress. I thought about what I like and what I don't like. And I find that the more I try to celebrate the Christmas season with all the trappings, the less I enjoy it. You can almost have too much Christmas. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but I think it's true. Sometimes we get so carried away with trying to have everything that we don't appreciate what we do have. Sometimes it just, you look around the house or the, the, uh, the church anywhere, and you could see to yourself, well, maybe this is enough. Maybe less is more. I don't know. But sometimes I feel like the more I try, the less I really enjoy it, the less time I take to enjoy it. I spend all my time worrying about it, or a lot of time, so that the meaning is lost. I really think Christmas has kind of changed over the years. It's become almost two different holidays, if you think about it. There's one holiday outside of the church that has Santa and reindeer and sleighs and gifts and presents and shopping and all of those things. And then we have what we do here, where we celebrate the birth of Christ. Those things are meant to be together, but over time, I think we, we're letting them separate each other. We're letting them drift away from one another. And I suggest that maybe that's why we find Christmas a little harder to celebrate and a little harder to enjoy because the meaning is getting left behind in some of the celebration. For example, like I said, the more I decorate, the less I like it, the less satisfying it becomes. You can only look around your house and see so many empty spots and think that needs a gift, that needs something to hang up. I can only hang another wreath over here or over there or I can only have one more Christmas light bouncing off my eyes at one time. It seems like we get a little too much. I keep adding more lights, more ornaments, fill every space, and it doesn't seem right. After a while, it just looks like Christmas exploded in the house, and it just loses some of its meaning. It loses some of the spirit of Christmas. Every year I try to purchase some special gifts too, and it's so tough because I buy for people, some people, who will remain nameless, who don't want to tell me what they want. I'm supposed to guess. I'm supposed to know. Well, I don't read minds that don't have a gift of prophecy for gift giving, so that makes it challenging. Uh, my kids are at the point where it's very easy. What do you want for Christmas? Cash. That's, that's all they want. Well, how about this, this nice sweater? No. How about this? How about that? No, just money. Write a check, and we're happy. That's my kind of shopping. But it also does take some of the fun out of it. When the kids were little, you had fun guessing what they would like, because you knew what the things they were into at the time and the things they would enjoy, so it was easier to find something. But as they got older, not as easy. Some gifts are good and some are not so good. As I walked around the mall this weekend, and I was out at the mall, Jimmy and I went shopping on Friday afternoon, and for the fun of it, we, we did buy a little bit, but not near as much as I thought we might. But I looked around, and even with all the masks on, there were a lot of people just did not look happy. There were a lot of folks who looked miserable walking around in the stores, like they just couldn't wait for this to all be over. And I was really surprised. I thought this year of all years, people would want to celebrate. They would enjoy at least being out of the house for a little while, but they didn't look that way. You could see the anger, the frustration, and just plain meanness on some of the faces of people trying to live up to the perfect image of what Christmas is supposed to be, at least in their minds, what they think it's supposed to be. I saw people carrying bags and things like that, 
The only guy that I saw that was really truly happy was a guy that was taking a nap at J.C. Penney's. He was sitting in a chair waiting for somebody, I don't know who, I would think his wife, but I don't, I don't want to make any assumptions. But he was sitting in a chair taking a nap and I envied that guy. I thought, wow, that's the perfect way to shop. Just sit down and sleep, let somebody else do it. He was the only guy I really think looked happy. The employees were smiling, saying, yeah, happy day, yay. But I know they weren't happy. They were frustrated, they were tired. Some of them probably exhausted. Is that where the real joy of Christmas was? And I didn't see it there. It wasn't to be found there, not in all that. Remember the ideal gift I, I asked you about? Think about that gift. And do you want anybody in your life, anybody you know, anybody you love, to be miserable trying to provide it for you? Would that gift be more special if your special person had to wait in line three hours to get it? or had to order it online 30 times before they got it, or it was out of stock or whatever, or they had to drive three states over to find the perfect thing. Would that make the gift better or worse? Would it mean more to you if they had to sacrifice greater for it? If it made them really truly miserable trying to find it, would it make the gift better or would it take away from it? What do you expect from your friends and your loved ones our expectations can be very high. Some of us have very high expectations, some not so much. The older I get, I find my expectations are lower. I'd rather just buy what I want for myself and not worry about trying to explain it to someone else. But that take, does take a little of the fun out of it. It is nice to get some surprise gifts, thoughtful things, right? We enjoy that. Christmas begins with a promise from God. It truly begins with a promise, it begins with a prophecy from Isaiah. He cries out to God to be forgiven. Isaiah knows the people have strayed away, they've done all kinds of bad things. He knows that his people are headed on the wrong path and he cries out to God. He acknowledges the power and the anger of God over humanity, over our sins. He acknowledges to God, you have every right to be mad at us because we're not doing the right thing. We are sinful and we repent. Isaiah says we are unclean and our righteous works are like filthy rags. It's like when we try to do something good to make up for a whole lot of bad stuff. Remember trying to do that when you were a kid? Maybe you, you broke some stuff or what, whatever at home, you forgot your chores. So you thought, well, I'll do something nice. I can remember my kids doing something bad and then they brought in a couple of dandelions and tried to give them the prayer saying, here, here mom, we love you. That's eh, not gonna make up for it our gifts that we try to, to do to make up for the, all of our shortcomings really fail to do that. The meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas is often surpassed by these things that we worry about in our material life. Our meager attempts to do good are not really all that godly. And that's something we struggle with because we think they should be. We think they should mean more than they do. We think we should get more credit for the little good things we do the negative points for all the bad things that we do. We think somehow we can balance it out. Well, so I got a parking ticket. No big deal. I'll put an extra quarter in the Salvation Army bucket. That'll make up for my parking faux pas. If you curse out the cashier at Walmart over the sale price of the tinsel, just giving an extra quarter doesn't make up for it. It's not a good enough excuse for God. We don't buy our way out of our sins. We may think we can, we may think we can earn our way past them, but it really doesn't make up for it. Even the smiling faces of happy children with their fondest gifts do not erase the aggravation and the anger you may have went through to get it. You remember those days when you had to buy something like that, when you were trying to find the perfect thing that your kids wanted or somebody in the family really, really wanted but it was hard to get? And you see them open it and you're like, wow, that was really worth it. But then you think about it later. No, nah, it really isn't. 30 years ago, while well, I started writing this, I wrote 30 years ago, I thought a little bit more about it, about the Cabbage Patch dolls, and that's actually closer to 45 years ago. So I'm getting a little older now, I'm forgetting how 30 years ago was only 1990. So this was long before then. But the Cabbage Patch dolls were out, and I know some of you remember them. They were on the Christmas lists in many, many homes at the time, and fights were breaking out in the stores over Cabbage Patch dolls. People were actually injuring one another over Cabbage Patch dolls. 
I remember a local department store in Somerset had a drawing. Everybody went to the store one evening and you got a number. Everybody that went in got a number. And if they drew your number, you had the option, the chance to buy a Cabbage Patch doll. You had the option to buy it. And I can remember being at the store for those couple of hours with my mother and my brother, and all three of us had our magic tickets hoping we would win. Now my brother and I had zero interest in these ugly little dolls. But my mother said to us, you know those dolls are selling for like $200. People were buying them for 20 or whatever their price was, and they were selling them in the parking lot for like 200 bucks. So at the time we're thinking, well, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good business to get into. Buy for 20, sell for 200, right? So there we were, waiting and waiting. And every time the numbers would get called, you'd hear somebody go, oh, like that, and you'd know they won. And then you'd hear a whole lot of other people going, ah. Oh. We have to wait another 15 minutes for the next number to be drawn. And then finally they got to the last number and, and a lot of people went away sad. And I keep thinking about that. Years later, Tickle Me Elmo came out and I was working at a drugstore at the time when Tickle Me Elmo came out. And I can remember people coming in and getting angry with me because our store did not have Tickle Me Elmo. I said, we're a drugstore. Why would you expect to buy Tickle Me Elmo here? We have batteries, how about batteries? How about aspirin, you're gonna need that. But no, they wanted Tickle Me Elmo, that was all the rage. And then after that, there were all kinds of other things. Every year something, I don't know what it is anymore, I don't pay attention now, I don't have to. So don't worry about it. But remember, I wonder if all the people who did all those crazy things, got into fights, said horrible things to other people, were really satisfied with those gifts that they got. Was the reaction of their kids on Christmas morning worth it? How many of those toys wound up in the trash a week later, a month later? When the batteries of the Tickle Me Elmo wore out, how many kids bothered to replace them? Did the toy just wind up in the, end of the, in the bottom of the toy box to be sent to Goodwill later on? I wonder, how many of those ugly Cabbage Patch kids wound up in the landfill? Probably most of them. I would bet most of them did. I don't know that for sure. But I always found them kind of creepy, but that's just me. But wonder, is it worth it? How many people sold out their dignity, their lives, and got into trouble over these dumb little pieces of plastic that were made over in China? Isaiah had good news for us, even us. God is with us, and he's willing to remold us like clay into useful vessels. So when we do dumb things, when we make ourselves kind of useless, God reshapes us. Have you ever seen a potter's wheel? If the potter messes up making something, he just smashes it all down and starts over again. That's what God does with us. God will forget our transgressions, our pettiness, and remold us into something powerful, into a vessel of his spirit. We can be forgiven and reminded what this season is all about, what Advent and Christmas are really about. In our lesson from the book of Mark, Jesus is telling his disciples about the end of the age, his second coming. In the darkness of the world's ignorance and confusion, we'll look up to heaven and see him coming in the clouds of power and glory. It'll be a wonderful sight. It'll be a powerful image, a powerful sight. His angels will then gather in the faithful from all corners of the world. Jesus gave the disciples the signs that would announce his return. He said, watch for these things and know that it will happen. Before this generation goes, these things will take place. The challenge for us is the timing. No one knows the day and the hour of Christ's return. Even the angels and Jesus himself don't know. Only God the Father knows. And for this reason, we have to be ready at any time. And that makes it tough and challenging for us. Imagine if you had to wait every Sunday morning for me to call you and tell you what time church is going to be. Imagine if I called you at 4 o'clock in the morning and said, be here at 5. How many of you would have been here at 5? I can't even raise my hand. I wouldn't have been here at five. But imagine that, if that's how every week would go. And if you didn't know the church was going to be on Sunday, I could call you on a Tuesday at midnight and say, be at church at 1, 1 a.m. this morning. We're going to have worship. And then the next week it would be on a Wednesday or a Friday or whatever. Imagine how hard it would be to plan anything if that's what you were expecting. If all things were just a surprise to us. How do you get ready for that? 
How do you get ready for anything that's going to be a surprise, that you don't know when it's gonna happen? You prepare by having things ready ahead of time, by planning to go. I know when Chris was expecting Jimmy, we had a go bag, we had that bag ready, all the stuff that had to go to the hospital. I think by the time Danny came along, we just threw stuff in a shopping bag and walked out the door. But by, for Jimmy, we were prepared. I had a bag in the car. I had a bag in our bedroom. I had a bag in the bathroom. I had all this stuff ready because I was going to be planned. And when the time came, we called the hospital and the doctor said, oh, wait another hour or two before you come in. You don't have to be here that early. And I said to Chris, no, get in the car right now. I don't want to be surprised. Be ready. And that's how we did. Jesus tells us to be aware. Keep awake. I cannot help but think he's talking to us as we walk around like we're anesthetized, like we're just going through the motions celebrating a frivolous holiday. That's not what God wants us to do. That's not how we get ready for Christmas. We don't get ready for Christmas by just going through these motions. We get ready for Christmas by preparing our hearts and our minds and our souls for what Christ is bringing to us. The ideal gift that you imagine, is it real? Is it powerful? Is it life-changing in some real way? Is it worth the intervention of God? Think about that thing I asked you about at the beginning. Is it worth saying to God, please move heaven and earth to make my dream come true? Lord, move heaven and earth so that I have a new Camaro sitting in my driveway on Christmas morning, just like those commercials. I keep thinking someday maybe that'll happen. Chris will go out and surprise me with a car. Now I know that's not how the world works. And if I surprised Chris by buying a car without telling her, <laughs> I'd be sleeping in that car. That's how that would go. But we all think about these things, these things that, are, that seem so valuable to us. But ask yourself, do you think they're worth God's time to ask for? And if not, then maybe there's something better that we should plan for and ask for. If our ideal gift is not love, hope, peace, and joy, then perhaps we have to start over in our thinking about the holiday, about Advent, about Christmas, about who we are. Jesus was not born to complete our shopping list or our wish list or to decorate our homes or even to provide for our basic needs. Jesus' birth did not make everyone nice and full of Christmas cheer. I wish that was true, but it isn't. It doesn't make people better. We like to think it does, and we try for a little while at least, but it really doesn't. Because what makes the world better comes through us, from God. It has to start with God and come through our hearts. If we're waiting for Jesus to make this world kinder and gentler, we're going to remain disappointed because he has given us that job. He has told us how to do it, and he's given us the tools to do it, but we're the ones that have to make it happen. Jesus was sent to save our very souls and to show us the path to God's kingdom. By claiming this gift, we offer ourselves as vessels, as vessels of hope, peace, joy, and love. Like the potter making the cup. That's what Jesus is doing with us. He's making us into that cup, that vessel that holds hope, peace, joy, and love. But we have to do what we're called to do. Jesus transforms the world by changing our hearts and how we see and feel everyone else. If we feel that true spirit within us, then the world does look brighter and we can celebrate it and bring that brightness to others. The love, hope, and joy, and peace of Christ dwells in you and me, and that's how it comes in to the world. It starts with God's gift to us, and then we bring it to others. If we don't feel it, we need to open our gift. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the gift of your Son that we celebrate through this season. We ask that you remind us of the power of this gift and what it truly means for us and what it can truly mean for the world. Lord, where we don't feel the right things, we ask that you remind us to search, search our hearts first for the gifts of your spirit. We ask, Lord, that you help us to follow the path your son has set before us. Fill us with courage and wisdom that we may truly understand what you give to us. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name in the way that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we normally take up our offering, and as always, our plates are in the front and the back, so I please encourage you to continue bringing those in or sending, mailing them in, as you will, and I thank everybody at home sending in their gifts to our churches. And if you're not a member of the church, I still implore you to continue being generous to those uh, charities around us. There are still a great many needs, needs that are, have existed for months now, but they still continue and then in some ways are amplified in the holiday season. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts you provide to us and to show you our gratitude, we offer you the first fruits of our labor for the work of the church. We give these gifts along with our time and our discipleship as we live to serve you and to share the gospel with all the world. This we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. At this time, I invite you to join me in the order of communion. We have our little cups. Does everyone have their little cup? And I'll remind you, you have to tear off the top part for the wafer. So I ask you to, to do that now and just hold on to that wafer for a moment. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread like this, similar to this, and he broke it before his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In this way they shared with him. They shared what he was, his essence. And that essence becomes part of us as well. We become part of Christ. We become part of one another when we consume this bread together. So I say, take this bread, take and eat in remembrance of Christ. After supper, he poured out the cup and said to them, this cup is, my, is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. We take this cup and we drink it, reminding ourselves and reminding us before God that we are united in Christ's blood, that we are forgiven in Christ's blood. We are given a new chance. We are remolded in the potter's hands by partaking of Christ. Take this cup. It is the blood of Christ shed for you and me. Take a drink in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have shared with you in this holy and humble meal. We ask, Lord, that you bind us to you and to your Son and to one another as we live to serve you, as we become the body of Christ, spiritually, physically, and mentally. May our hearts be altered and changed. May our very being be transformed by your power and your love. May your Holy Spirit fill us with delight, with peace, with hope, with love, with joy, all of these wonderful gifts that we celebrate during this season of Advent. Remind us that we are brought together at your table. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I ask all who are able to please rise for our final hymn, number 122.
Go forth and celebrate this day of hope, this beginning of something new, this transformation of our spirits into the loving manifest of God. Go forth and go in peace. Amen. Did you like my fireplace, Chuck? I did. I like that. The old, the old yeah. Very nice. I was pleased that the light stayed on there. So no noise when you turned them on today? Turned on? No, I didn't hear anything.